As we begin, I do have a confession to make. Uh, that is that uh, I've been hearing references throughout the conference to professional theologians and uh, eventually looked down at my name tag and realized they, they might be talking about me and uh, a few others. And my secret is that I'm actually a pastor who likes to masquerade as a professional theologian. Uh, so what I'm about to do with you here is really my reason for being, uh, to proclaim the glory of the triune God. And everything that I've studied and written and done, everything that I preach is only a means to this end, to set forth the glory, the majesty of God as the heart of the gospel. And I really believe that this is the great need that we have today with respect to the doctrine of the Trinity, is as much as I have zeal and passion, and my brothers do, for explaining the doctrine and defending the doctrine and uh, uh, giving the lie, as it were, to false doctrines, ultimately, if we do not know this God as our God, then it's all for nothing, isn't it? We must ultimately know the right God in the right way. We must know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom He has sent, and we can only do this by the power of the Spirit in our hearts. And so the Trinity ought to be dear to our souls as the gospel is dear to our souls. And the more the triune God stands at the heart of the gospel, the more clearly we proclaim the gospel. John Owen once said that the primary reason the regenerate heart delights in the gospel is because of the way in which it glorifies God and sets the majesty of God on display. So why is the doctrine of the Trinity relevant to us? Why is it practical? How do we pursue, as the title indicates here, communion or fellowship with God? ultimately because knowing God is everlasting life, and the great glory of the gospel is knowing the Father through the Son by the Holy Spirit. This is the foundation of all Christian doctrine, of all faith, of all life. Now, I intend to present what I have to say to you in about 40 minutes or, or less with the Lord's help, but in a sense, I feel like I'm about to preach to you the entire New Testament. What I've actually done here is taken five sermons on the Trinity and the life of Christ and pulled them together in one to give you a survey and an overview. And the title, Communion with God, allows me to basically say anything I want because everything is communion with God. Worship preaching, sacraments, prayer, what we believe, what we do, changing diapers, rearing children, going to work on Monday. Everything is communion with God. So what I want to do here to narrow this down is to say something like this. Christ's communion with God is a pattern for our communion with God. Or let me just put it differently. The Trinity in the life of Christ is the pattern for the Trinity in the life of the Christian. Or I could simply say it this way. What we're looking at right now is the Trinity, the Christ, the Christian. The work of the triune God in and through His incarnate Son to bring you into fellowship with Himself. That's ultimately what we're looking at. And I want to look at this in, in five ways, and really I've not read one text to you because I have five texts, and I'm going to treat each of them briefly, but they go through stages of Christ's life. First, we'll consider, as you might suspect, His incarnation, and then His life, His ministry, and then His death on the cross, His resurrection. By this point, you know where this is going. His ascension and His pouring out of the Spirit. And in each of these things, what we're going to see is that Christ's communion with God is the pattern of your communion with God and mine. And we're going to see it in each of these stages. Well, the first thing we should look at is the Trinity 
and Christ's incarnation. I know I just gave you my, my introduction, and this is a little bit risky, but I think it'll, it'll tie this together, um, a sub-introduction. Uh, basically, sometimes we undercut the gospel and the glory of the gospel, not just by neglecting the Trinity, but by neglecting Jesus. And what do I mean by that? Jesus is not some sort of cosmic vending machine that you put your, your money in. I almost said quarters, but you put your money in, and, and He dispenses a little bit of justification, a little bit of forgiveness. Jesus Christ Himself is the gospel. And when you are in the throes of dealing with sin and temptation, you don't need a vending machine that dispenses justification to soothe your conscience and make you feel better in spite of yourself. You need a Savior who was born of the Spirit that you might be born of the Spirit. You need a Savior that lived in communion with the Spirit so that you might submit to God's law in the Spirit. You need a Savior who died for your sins to remove the wrath of God from you. You need a Savior who rose from the dead that you might live in Him in this life and in the next, and you need a Savior who has ascended into heaven so that you have a place secured in Him right now. You need a whole Christ to save you as a whole person, and you need a whole Trinity to bring you to a whole Christ. So there's my risky second sub-introduction, but in a sense, I have nothing else to say. I've, I've given you the sermon. Now look at the parts. What do we do with Christ's incarnation? How do we see Christ's communion with God as the pattern of ours? Well, in Luke chapter 1, and this is my first text, and you'll know it, Christ was born of the Spirit that we might be born of the Spirit. What, what do I mean? That requires some explanation, doesn't it? Christ doesn't need to be born again like you need to be born again. But everything in the life of the Christian from the new birth to the resurrection of the dead is rooted in the Lord Jesus Christ and the work of the triune God in Him. Jesus is the gospel. And what do we see first? Well, we see the incarnation, don't we? The eternal Son of God became man, and how did He do this, and how does this make the Trinity personal, practical to us? Well, who sent the Son? Is it not the Father? The Father did not become man, the Son did, and the Father sent His Son. You know, we've often heard in our day that um, uh, the Holy Spirit is the forgotten person of the Trinity. I actually believe the Father is the forgotten person of the Trinity. And let me just illustrate this with this text and others around it. My dear friends, who so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son? It's the Father, isn't it? The love of Christ passes knowledge. But why did Christ come? Why was He born of a woman? Why was He made under the law for the suffering of death? Because behind the work of the Lord Jesus and even behind the incarnation is a loving Father who sent His Son to save His people from their sins. And the Father sends the Son. And it is the Son and not the Father and not the Spirit who becomes man. One thing we need to understand is the gospel is about knowing the right God in the right way. But we also learn, as you've heard in bits and pieces so far, that God does what He does because He is who He is. Jesus did not need to take on human flesh to save anyone. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit would have been perfectly satisfied and justified in enjoying their own fellowship in the Godhead, not only from eternity past, but for all time and above time and beyond time. And Christ voluntarily became man. The Father so loved the world that He sent His Son. But how does the angel explain the incarnation in the text that I've alluded to in Luke 1? The Holy Spirit will overshadow your womb. And that holy thing that will, will come from you and be born of you will be called the Son of God. It would not be fitting for the Father who is unbegotten to become man. It would not be fitting for the Spirit who proceeds from the Father to become incarnate. It is fitting for the Son who is eternally begotten of the Father to become man. He didn't have to be, but this is that language of it was fitting to be. 
you know, this raises the issue of the so-called economic ontological trinity. A couple of us were, were talking about this earlier. Um, here's my other secret. I don't like the language. It's too new for me, um, in, in, historically. And it gives the impression that here's one God up here, here's another God up here. Maybe they agree. Maybe they're the same kind of God. Maybe not. But let me think about it this way. My sister is an, an artist. I, my half-sister. She's really my sister. But I mean my, uh, my stepsister, my wife's sister. Um, she's an artist. And uh, I can look at her paintings and I can, I can see her character. I can see everything she's doing in, in the art. But it's not her. There's no ontological Victoria and economic Victoria. There is her person, who she is, and there's her work and the evidences of her hands. And that's really what we're talking about with God. God does what He does because He is who He is. The Father sends the Son, the Son becomes man, and He is overshadowed in the, the virgin's womb by the power of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Father is of none, the Son is of the Father, and the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son together. And this means in everything God does in Christ's life, in your life, in creation, in everything, every divine work originates with the Father, is effected by the Son, perfected by the Spirit. Now, that's going to help you understand this and apply it to your own heart, I hope as well as connect the other dots that I've, I've thrown out there and I want to string back together. God sent His Son. The Son voluntarily became man. And the Spirit, speaking theologically, united the two natures in one person. This is what I mean by Christ was born of the Spirit. Not that His heart needs changing. This is the sinless Son of God, isn't it? Not just the Son of God, but the Son of God who became man. And in Him we, as it were, see a double image of God. The express image of the Father's person, the brightness of His glory, and really the only true human being who has lived since Adam. A perfect, sinless human being. Born of the Spirit. And what I'm doing here in this message is showing you there's always a parallel, put on my theologian hat for a moment, between Christology and soteriology. What God does in and through Jesus and what God is doing in Jesus in you. Always connected. Christ was born of the Spirit that you might be born of the Spirit. You know, we looked at some wonderful passages from Isaiah this week, haven't we? There's another one that's interesting in, in Isaiah 11 where the Spirit of the Lord comes upon the servant, the Messiah. Not there the language of the servant, but you know what I mean. And, and among other things, it's interesting, what does the Spirit do in the, the Son of God who became man? He fills him with wisdom, with knowledge, with the fear of God. Isn't that interesting? Does the Son of God in human flesh need the Spirit to have the fear of God, to obey God, to trust God? Absolutely. Because if He was independent and He trusted in Himself, He would be a sinner like us. But He is a man born of the Spirit, a man filled with the Spirit, a man dependent on the Spirit, that you might be born of the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, dependent on the Spirit. Christ was born of the Spirit, that you might be born of the Spirit. Have you been born of the Spirit? Have you been born from above? How do you know? Well, let me just take Owen's test I've already thrown at you. What is your view of God? Do you delight in this gospel because of what it reveals to you of God Himself? Do you desire to be like Him? Do you have something of Augustine's spirit, even if you don't like everything Augustine said? to see Him as He is, to behold His glory. The Spirit was upon Jesus from His conception onward. The Spirit is upon you from your conception onward in the new birth. Second thing, we see that the Trinity pervades Christ's life and ministry. So incarnation, now we're moving ahead a little bit. Life and ministry. What's my text? 
I have to go through them verbally for the sake of time rather than turning to each one. Uh, but, but my text here is Matthew 3, Jesus' baptism. So what happens next? Jesus is born of the Spirit that, he might be born, that we might be born of the Spirit. He's conceived by the Spirit and sanctified by the Spirit that we in Christ might be born again, anew by the Spirit. But then we see Him in His baptism. And once again, we see the glorious Trinity, don't we? The Father sends His Son. The Son comes. The Spirit overshadows Mary's womb. Now what do we see again? The Father speaking from heaven, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The Son is obvious, isn't He? He's there, and heaven is open, as it were, and the Spirit descends upon Him as a dove. Why? Because the same Spirit who conceived Him and knit the two natures together in the womb of Mary is now coming upon Him and filling Him and equipping Him to go forth and fulfill His earthly ministry. Now, you need to understand here, Christ means anointed one. You realize that some of you children are, who are here, Jesus uh, is, is His name. His name is Jesus because He'll save His people from their sins. Christ is not His last name. It's His office. It's His title. He's the anointed one. And really, what do we see in Matthew 3? The anointed one, anointed with the Holy Spirit above measure. And the Spirit who set Him apart as a prophet, priest, and king from His conception is now sending him out in his public ministry to declare the kingdom of God. Now, this does a lot, brings a lot of freight with it. What's the first thing that happens when Jesus is filled with the Spirit? The Spirit drives him into the wilderness to be tested of the devil. Adam was tested in a garden with every possible advantage, and he fell and ruined the whole human race. The second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, the man full of the Spirit, is driven into a wilderness with every possible disadvantage, and he is tempted by the tempter, and he succeeds, and he overcomes him, and ultimately crushes his head on the cross. The man full of the Spirit. Now, everything I've said here from the baptism goes through the whole life. Jesus was born of a woman made under the law. He was born of the Spirit that you might be born of the Spirit, but He was also filled with the Spirit that you might be filled with the Spirit. Jesus had all the gifts and the graces of the Spirit that you might have some of the gifts of the Spirit and eventually all the graces of the Spirit. He had the Spirit without measure that we might have the Spirit by measure. And you realize it's only as a church that we, we see all the gifts of Jesus by the Spirit on display. And we need each other, don't we, in the church. And it's really only in communion in the church, as Thomas Manton once said, that uh, we are not just imitators of God's character, but God's triunity, His unity, His diversity. But we see this all rooted in Jesus, don't we? He obeyed the law by dependence on the Spirit because you've disobeyed the law. He fulfilled all righteousness by the Spirit's power within Him to the glory of His Father because you and I have none. He endured every trial and hardship throughout this life, the temptations of Satan, all the, the infirmities that accompany us in a sin-laden world that he might take the sting and the wrath of God out of every trial, every hardship, every difficulty, not taking the hardship out, but the sting of it. You realize that every hardship you would have in this life, just like in his, would be evidence of the wrath of God against you and would only be a foretaste of things to come if Jesus, filled with the Spirit, did not obey for you, suffer for you, live for you, and ultimately die for you. See what I mean about we need a bigger Jesus than what's often presented to us? Not just a, a, a vending machine for justification, but a whole Christ to save whole Christians. Jesus lived under the curse of God that you might not bear it. Jesus obeyed the law of God by the Spirit's power that you might be filled with the Spirit 
and be transformed and renewed in the image of God. And I could go on and on and on and on. But what do we have thirdly? The Trinity in Christ's death. We've seen Trinity in incarnation. Christ was born of the Spirit that you might be born of the Spirit. We see the, the Trinity in Christ's life, His ministry, especially His baptism. He has a, a, a Spirit without measure that you might have the Spirit by measure, and this relates to obedience and suffering and all these other things. But what comes next? It's His death, isn't it? We rightly summarize the gospel, or Paul has, in terms of uh, preaching nothing but Christ and Him crucified. We know, don't we, that, that the cross is the centerpiece, and it ought to be. Do we realize the cross is a Trinitarian altar? I'm referring here to Hebrews 9. And there is the author is explaining uh, the glorious work of Jesus Christ. Uh, what he basically does there is he says that, that through the eternal Spirit, he offered himself as a sacrifice without blemish to God. Now, what I find very interesting is, is if you read Bible commentaries on a passage like that, they're going to go back and forth and say, well, does the Spirit mean Jesus' Spirit or does it mean the Holy Spirit? And people do this with all kinds of individual passages. You know, John, John 4, we must worship in spirit and truth, which I take the, uh, the early church interpretation there too, that this is uh, in the Holy Spirit and in Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life through whom we come to the Father. And, and we start debating, what do these texts mean? But, but what I'm saying is here, one way to look at all these passages is, brothers and sisters, think about the mind of, of the Spirit and Scripture as a whole. If it was one isolated passage, you might say, well, Spirit means my Spirit, Jesus' Spirit, etc. But what I want you to do is leave this message today, go back and reread your Bibles, and see the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit all over the place in everything. I have to say, in some sense, I, I'm, I've learned to think this way because I've been discipled by two men under God's providence. One was the Apostle Paul, and the other was John Owen. And I've not met uh, either one in person, and I hope to meet them one day. But this saturates their thinking. And what do we have here? By the Holy Spirit, Jesus, as high priest, offered himself, priest and sacrifice, to God the Father. And what happens here? Ultimately, the Father pours out His wrath and curse on the Son that He might not pour it out on you. Now, do you hope to go to God any other way? I mean, think about this. When we think about the Trinity, one thing we need to recognize is God loves His Son more than He loves you, more than He can love you. And what greater display of the love of God can He show to you and can He show to me than taking His Son, who is His beloved and whom He's well pleased and whom He's delighted with above heaven and earth and anything that is or could be, and said, I have so loved the world, I've given my only begotten Son. And here the Son says, I come to do Your will, O Father, and I trust in your spirit, and by your spirit I offer up myself to satisfy divine justice. Do you realize? Now think about this. I'm assuming if you're here, you're, you're here because you want to hear the gospel, you want to hear a conference, you want to know the Lord better. But can you imagine a more dreadful sin in the sight of God than hearing this and saying, no, thank you? Not for me. You know, the Spirit comes and He convicts the world of sin, not just because they've read the wall over here and they've seen the Ten Commandments and they know they've broken God's law. Jesus says He will convince them of sin because they don't believe in Me. It doesn't get lower and higher than that at the same time. There is nothing more offensive in God's eyes than to hear the glorious work of God's Son and to harden your heart against the appeals of God's Spirit. Because there is nothing more glorious that God has done in heaven and on earth than revealing Himself in this great work. We need to appeal to people with compassion. But we also need to stress the urgency of this message. 
we must see the glory of God's Son, and we can only see it by the power of the Spirit. He offered himself to the Father by the eternal Spirit. Fourthly and briefly, now I'm into Romans 8. Resurrection. Christ's communion with the Trinity, Christ's communion with God is the pattern for ours. We've seen that He was born of the Spirit that we might be born of the Spirit. He was filled with the Spirit without measure that we might have Him by measure. He offered Himself to God by the Spirit that through the Spirit we may come to God by the Son. Now what do we see? The Spirit of the Father raised Jesus from the dead. And I wish I could spend the rest of the time in this glorious chapter. I'm actually doing a whole conference um, at, at Matthew Hulse Church soon uh, on this topic from Romans 8, the Trinity and sanctification. Here's the secret to my ministry. Every sermon is about the Trinity. Um, not very hidden. Why? Because what is he saying here? The same Spirit by whom the Father raised His Son from the dead now dwells in your heart. And that is good news for you, because it means that He who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies, unless you think, well, that's all nice and that all sounds uh, well and good, but I've still got to change the diapers. I've still got to go to work on on Monday morning. I've still got uh, uh, three boys, and uh, if you put two of them together, they're perfect, but when you add the third one, then it's like dynamite suddenly coming into the room. Not that this has happened to me. But you get the idea. You've got life that goes on. And that sounds great. Eternal life. Something to look forward to at at the end of the day. But what about right now? What's Paul actually saying? Jesus was raised by the Spirit of the Father. And the Spirit of the Father dwells in you now. The Spirit of Christ dwells in you now. And you are resurrected today. What you will experience at the last day will be the completion of where you've begun now. And that means that everything is transformed. You know, I often, I often tell our children, I, I don't know what the Lord's going to call you to do, but I do know this. How you do what you do is far more important than what you do in life. I would rather preach the gospel of Jesus Christ than anything else the Lord can give me to do. And yet at the same time, whether you're collecting garbage or you're serving as an engineer or you're working in a grocery store or preaching the gospel, Ultimately, are you, are you united to Christ? Does the Spirit of God dwell in your heart? You know, Augustine says in City of God that Christians and non-Christians suffer the same things, but the difference is in the sufferers. Our relationship to God makes all the difference, but that's true for everything else, isn't it? To be filled with the Spirit is for the Spirit to be painting an image of Jesus in your heart. We shouldn't have these in our windows, in our children's books. But the real image of Jesus is the one the Spirit is making in your hearts and in our churches. Because the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us. Christ was born of the Spirit that you might be born of the Spirit. Christ was filled with the Spirit without measure that you might have Him by measure. Christ offered up Himself to the Father by the Spirit, so that by the Spirit, through the Son, God may be your Father and your God. Christ was raised by the power of the Spirit from the Father, so that the Spirit of Christ dwells in you and you might live to God. You see what I'm doing? Trinity Christ Christian, Trinity Christ Christian, Trinity Christ Christian. We must think this way. And I have literally been begging the Holy Spirit all week and all morning that He would burn these things into the depths of our souls. That every prayer you offer, every time you worship, everything you think, everything you do in life, you must think in these terms. The Trinity, the Christ, the Christian. The Trinity, the Christ, the Christian. The Trinity, the Christ, the Christian. Everything that God has done in Jesus, the Spirit, as it were, is replicating in some sense in us. This is the gospel, dear friends. I still have one more point, but, but this is why it's a shame on us that if, if uh, my friend Carl Truman is to be believed, then uh, the best-selling Christian books today are on Christian dieting. In the fourth and fifth century, they were on the Trinity and the person and work of Christ. Christ. 
Honestly, my friends, if you get nothing else from this conference, I and my brothers, I think, would agree. This is what we want etched into your souls, is a hunger and thirsting for this God, a desiring after more. What's the last thing? Not just resurrection, but His reign. We see incarnation, we see His life, His ministry, we see His death, His resurrection, but we also see His ascension and His reign. And let me just appeal to one text. Peter is there, and he is preaching in Acts chapter 2. And he's quite bold, isn't he? He goes to an audience that was hostile, and so hostile to Jesus, that they sent Him to a cross. Peter was, was uh, shaking in his sandals, as it were, and so intimidated the first time that as he watched from afar, he denied Jesus three times. And these are glorious scenes in Acts 2, 3, 4, and 5 when you see Peter the preacher come out. And you're almost sitting there with bated breath if you've read it the first time asking, what's he going to do this time? The same people are named. There's Annas. There's Caiaphas. There are the chief priests. And I'm lumping together three chapters here. Uh, but, but here is Peter, no longer denying Christ, but proclaiming Christ, and even saying to this audience, God appointed this Jesus to be Savior, but you've crucified Him with lawless hands. And they get the point. Th these men want to bring this man's blood on us. And Peter is saying, yes, I do, because you must repent and you must believe, and you must turn to the Lord Jesus if you would be saved. And what's the explanation of the whole thing and the linchpin of really the entire book of Acts? It's chapter 2, verse 33. Peter explains, Jesus ascended up into heaven, and He received the Holy Spirit from the Father, and He poured Him out. And that's, that's the explanation for what you now see and hear. This is not the acts of the apostles. This is the act of the ascended Jesus Christ by His Word and by His Spirit through weak and fallible and sinful men. And you really see the Trinity in Christ's life coming to its own. Now again, the Father is of none. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father. The Spirit eternally proceeds from Father and Son, or take Augustine's language. Spirit is, is gift coming from uh, Father through the Son, Father and Son. And what do you see in Acts chapter 2? God does what He does because He is who He is. Why does He pour out the Holy Spirit after gifting Him to Jesus? Because that's who He is. Whether you like the term ontological economic or not, I, I, don't, prefer, I don't prefer it. But, uh, but regardless of what we're getting at, we need to know this. The God who reveals Himself to us is the real God. He's more than He's revealed Himself to us. If we saw Him just like Moses, we couldn't live. And we need to treasure what He has revealed. We need to trust that the reason why we come to God by the Spirit through Jesus Christ to call Him our Father is because that's who He is. The Spirit comes out upon the church and equips us to come to Christ, to proclaim Christ, to serve Christ, because the Father has gifted Him to Christ to pour out upon the church. Owen calls this the voluntary condescension of the Spirit as well not just the voluntary condescension of Christ. But He who is God is sent by God to bring us to God. What a glorious gospel we have, dear friends. You realize one thing that's been in the background during this whole conference is, uh, is really this issue. Why has God revealed Himself so fully, so clearly as triune? It corresponds to the gospel, doesn't it? Why is the Trinity there but more veiled in the Old Testament? Because the gospel is there but more veiled in the Old Testament. Because the gospel, dear friends, is God. God Himself offering Himself to you in His Son and accompanying the preaching of the Word with the Spirit's power. Ultimately, what we offer to people is nothing more and nothing less than the triune God. He is the gospel. 
So here are your five keys to Christian living. I have five points if you, if you miss that. We see the Trinity, the Christ, the Christian all the way through. And we will see the Trinity, the Christ, the Christian into eternity. Christ's communion with God is a pattern for yours. Do you look to Jesus Christ for everything? Do you look to be born of the Spirit as he, in a very different sense, was born of the Spirit? Do you look to receive the Spirit of Christ that he might dwell in you and give you the gifts and graces of the Spirit to serve him and honor him? Do you look to the Christ who, by the Spirit, served and obeyed his Father as your prophet, your priest, your king, that you might approach God in Christ and reign with him forever? and know and make known the will of God for salvation? Do you look to the Jesus who's in heaven and sends the Spirit to you to return again to receive you for him, to himself? Are you confident, dear friend, that you have a place in heaven because Jesus is there? And Jesus' intercession in heaven is not a cosmic wrestling match between a father who can't wait to get his hands on you and the son who is powerful enough to hold him back. But it is a son who always intercedes according to the will of his father that he might grant the spirit to his asking children because we have a united trinity who is for us, not a divided trinity. Well, you've been very patient and given me good attention, and I appreciate it, and I trust the Spirit blesses these things to your hearts. Honestly, uh, I feel more like the author of the Song of Solomon than a systematic theologian here, and I wish I could preach these things all day. But go forth with them. May the Lord stir your hearts. May you hunger and thirst after this God and never be satisfied till you see Him in glory. Let us pray.